Hey, you guys, welcome back to another episode of the Homeschooling Families podcast. I am really excited to have Amy Roberts with us this week. Amy is a great friend. I got to know her really, really early in Teach Them Diligently. She was such an encouragement to both David and I. Um, and has been through the years. We haven't gotten to see each other for a while, but she's coming back to teach them diligently this year, and we're so excited. So, Amy, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. I am so excited to be here, and I'm so excited to be joining you guys again this year. It's been so long. I know, I know. Well, life gets in the way sometimes, and the Lord knows the seasons that he gives us. So we are thrilled that you're back. But for those who maybe knew, maybe weren't here the last time that you were with us, can you tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you've been doing for the last many years? Sure. So my name is Amy Roberts and I blog at RaisingArrows.net and I've had that blog for 16, 17 years now. Um, So I started way back when blogs were a new thing and um, I have 10 children. I am a military wife. And so we've moved a lot and, um, we, um, so let's see, I'm sorry. I'm kind of off here for a second. You're good. Um, We got, we got (laughs) it. Great. So, um, yeah, so we are just a busy homeschooling family. I'm a busy mom, busy blogger, all of that stuff. And, um, that's what we've been doing. We now have Let's see, four kids graduated from our homeschool and two of them are married and we have a grandbaby. So life has really changed over the last few years. It's amazing how quickly that happens. We were just talking before we've had two get married this year alone. Um, And it just life just keeps going. And and I can honestly say, although we're brand new to this new season, that I still like every season better than the one before. It's like the Lord, as he's growing us and our kids, it just gets more fun and more exciting all along the way. Yes. There's been an adjustment, you know, from it being me having children to my kids having children. Oh, I'm sure. It's been such a blessed season too, you know, more than I could have possibly imagined. Well, and that's, I think that all comes down to, to the relationships that we're building with our kids when we're, when they're young. I think that's why we're able to say every season is better because we're actually building on those seasons instead of, you know, starting fresh each time. Yeah, absolutely. I just see where my relationship with my kids is just getting deeper and deeper and stronger and growing. And I mean, I tell people all the time, you may love your kids, but I like my kids. (laughs) My kids are enjoyable to be around. You know, I don't just love them. I like them. Well, and the the flip side of that is they like you too. They, that's why they keep coming around. And that's one of the things that's been so amazing and so exciting for David and I to see as our kids have grown up and gotten married and and launched out is they keep coming back. They're calling, they're sending pictures of what they're cooking. And, you know, it's like, we are still very much a part of their new life. And that is a joy that you can't even really put into words. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, it is wonderful. My 25-year-old is married and he still occasionally calls and we spend two hours on the phone solving the world's problems. Exactly. And then at the end, realizing we can't solve the world's problems and we hang up and, you know, do it again (laughs) another day. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's so awesome. But it really is the culmination of all of these little menial conversations you're having and you think that they don't matter for anything. And yet God uses all of those little steps and weaves together these deep seated relationships that he is going to use to point your kids to Christ. But then the generational impact that we're making with, with our faithfulness day in and day out cannot be overstated. No, no, absolutely not. Those relationships are so incredibly important and being able to, you know, recognize your own shortcomings and share those with your kids. I I say all the time that I need a savior just as much as they Mm -hmm. do. And I've got to preach the gospel to myself as much as I preach it to them every single day. And that builds those relationships where your kids realize you're not perfect Um, they're not perfect either. And we can grow in Christ together. (coughs) Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Um, And that's, that is an amazing 
proof of how great God's plan is for families and how he allows us to be a part of growing our children's faith, giving them that foundation. Um, and then we get to see it just as they grow and change throughout the years. Um, and that actually brings me, you know, you and I were talking beforehand. There has been just a really um, difficult thing to watch as we're seeing families now, you know, I guess maybe it's because our kids are getting older. So we're, we're kind of growing up with these other families and you're seeing, you're seeing some families that are kind of losing their way. They're, they're almost like they're rudderless now. Um, and, and I, I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that because, you know, we have, there, there are six of us, there are 12 of you guys in your core family. So those are some different realities. And I wanted to talk to you specifically about large families and how God has used you guys to really, really strengthen the faith of your kids and invest in discipleship in each of them, large family though you may be. Mm -hmm. um, and then how how your vision for your family, how your focus each day um, has stayed steady through the years. Yeah, and it's a very difficult thing. I, like you, I have seen other large families in particular crumbling around us, and it is very sad. And I can't help but think it really has to do with this swinging pendulum where we went from you know, here's what my childhood was, and I don't want that for my kids, all the way over to this extreme of we have to crack down, we have all these rules, we don't necessarily have a strong relationship with our kids, but those rules are going to keep them safe. They're going to keep them from being what we were or what we saw around us or what we're seeing in the culture today. And it became this method of ABC equals XYZ, and, and it wasn't a proven method. And if you right. look at scripture, you never see these methods that equal these outcomes like that. It is really a day-by-day -day faith walk with mm -hmm. Christ, leaning into him, abiding in him. Abiding is not really an action word. It is a sit there and be still and be with the Lord and steep yourself in this culture of Christ instead of, you know, trying to do all the things we see with the Pharisees. I mean, Jesus really came down hard on them because they were following a method. They were trying to create their own, um, their own culture that was perfect. And I think a lot of large families, particularly in the ATI movement with Bill Gothard, that they were building a culture of perfect that just cannot withstand. It's not a faith-filled culture. Um, they were, they thought they were building it on scriptural terms, but I remember looking at some of the materials and thinking, where is the scripture in this? Right. You know, that is not what the Bible says. You took that out of context and that they had these rules and those rules cannot withstand a faith storm. And they also cannot withstand a child growing up and looking around them and seeing that other people don't follow those rules and either they are fantastic Christians or, you know, the whole world hasn't come crashing down right. on them. You know, so obviously everything's fine. And um, I think that just was it, an eye opener for them. And it really brought them to a faith crisis. And some of those children have come out of that okay and stronger in their faith. And some of them have not. Right. Well, and I think we also saw or are seeing the result of years of leaning into rules and checklists instead of, like you noted, abiding in the Lord. So even as moms, and I, I talk about this every day in Teach Them Diligently 365, as moms, if we are not feasting on God's word, if we are not on our knees in prayer, actually growing in, in our own life with Christ, there's no way that we can pass on that authentically to our children because you can't give what you don't have. And right. so if you are focusing exclusively on this system, like you noted, or on, you know, just this checklist of things to, to knock out so that everything looks just so and keep your children safe, 
um, then you are not actually filling yourself up with with anything personally that will withstand when trials come, when kids start pulling on, you know, the, asking harder questions. That's yeah. one of the things that I, I realized when I was writing the Teach Them Diligently book that that train up a child verse in, in Proverbs, mm -hmm. the training up of a child is is like driving in a stake. We are as parents able to give them these deeply foundational truths, but we're driving in that stake so that as they start pulling on it, as the, the fruit, the tomato on the vine or whatever gets heavier and they're pulling on that stake, it's dug in deep enough to hold. And, and shallow things like rules and checklists and stuff just don't drive it in deep enough. No. And I think so much of what is taught or what was taught was an arrogance of their faith. Mm -hmm. It became here are the rules and we follow this, this and these other families don't. And so they are wrong. We are right. And we begin to look down our noses at other believers even. Mm -hmm. And there's not this body of believers. There's kind of this hierarchy of believers. And, you know, those of us who are following all the rules are at the top and there is no place for arrogance in our faith and in our family. We cannot be arrogant parents who will never say we're sorry, who never admit that we need a savior too. We cannot be those kinds of parents. Oh, absolutely. One of the things that God has taught us the most through uh, producing Teach Them Diligently events through the years is we have learned so much from other believers that outside of Teach Them Diligently, we probably wouldn't have connected with. You know, we we may have some differences in worship style or whatever. And yet, you know, when I pray with these these precious sisters in Christ, when we sing together, when we're actually discussing things of importance, we have so much in common because Christ yeah. is lifted up and we are seeking to, to build our families his way to, and we can do that together. Whereas when we're just focusing on the superficial things, all we see is the differences. And that is that, that, Satan has used that so much to isolate these families, right. which is probably also contributing to this sense of, of frustration and angst that a lot of them are having now. Yeah. We, you know, we can't go to a church that has, you know, people who don't homeschool. We can't go to a church with a youth group. It has to be family integrated. We can't, you know, there's all these rules that do eventually isolate you and make you think that, you know, you, you have to be a cookie cutter Christian. You have to be exactly like me or we can't fellowship together. You must not be a believer even. I mean, there's even that kind of arrogance that we are not sisters in Christ because maybe even because you don't homeschool and we have created this bubble that we really need to step outside of and allow our children to step outside of it at, alongside them. We walk alongside them with it. It's not like we're throwing them out there, but they right. need to be very aware of what the world is like. Because if you suddenly launch your arrows when they are 18, 19, 20 years old, and you have not prepared them for what the world is really like, you've lived in this bubble of, you know, here's how we dress and here's how our hair is and here's what we do. And, you know, 99% of people don't do that. And even Christians, it is going to burst that bubble when they get out there and they are going to flounder and it's going to be ugly for a while. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it really doesn't come down to the specific rules, the specific standards that a family may have. It, you know, that's not what we are talking about here. What we're talking about is a focus that is not on Christ and actually building your faith and strengthening with the the whole canon of scripture, strengthening your faith and giving your kids a foundation for their faith. Rather, you are focusing on things that are much more external and, and really a lot of times aren't even dealt with in scripture. Um, no, you know, you, no. our call as parents is to teach our children diligently to love God. Homeschooling is a great tool for that, but homeschooling yeah. is not our call. Homeschooling is a tool and it's very no. important that we remember that. 
Right. It is not our savior. Homeschooling is not a right? savior. What you, how you dress, how you wear your hair, what curriculum you use, not a savior. And we really have to continually be pointing back to Christ and walking it every single day, honestly, with our kids and not um, trying to seem like we're somehow perfect, holier than thou. You know, we have all the answers. There are going to be times when your kids are going to either come to you with a question you don't know the answer to, and you need to be honest with them. I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. Let me pray about it. Let me search the scripture. Let's search it together. And there will also be times when your kids push back, do something different from what you would want them to do. They may fall into some sort of sin as well. What's your response to that? And our response should always be restoration, not condemnation, not just trying to beat them down, but to restore them. That was right. just what Jesus was about, was restoring people. And so we want to be those, you know, restorers, those builders, those people who are trying to build relationships so that our kids can come to us when they're struggling, but also that we have that foundation in Christ that we know what to say, how to say it, and how to just keep loving them through that storm. Oh, absolutely. And that's where praying for your children very strategically comes in because um, it's amazing to me how often as I have prayed for my kids, God has directed the way that I've talked to them. Or he's even, you know, you as you look back and you're able to see in your rearview mirror, you see, I was praying this way. And these are the ideas that just seem to pop into my head that, you know, now it's the Holy Spirit was directing your steps. And he is yes. so involved and, and he is so good to answer our prayers. But so often we're praying so vaguely that we don't even notice his work. We are we are truly truly trying to do everything in our own power, which again comes down to those things that we feel like we can control rather than walking by faith and allowing the Lord to control us. Yes, exactly. And, and God is very good at knowing exactly what needs to be put in our lives at the mm -hmm. right time. And um, we just need to be again, abiding. We need to be abiding in the Lord and being ready, you know, to speak his words and to listen to him and sometimes to just be still. Sometimes as parents, we are really quick to come up with something to say. And sometimes we just need to be still and Absolutely. give it a minute. Absolutely. Well, and you alluded to something a little bit ago that I wanted to double back to. And that is those questions that you get asked. You know, you are, I guarantee you, no matter how good your kids are, you're going to get asked questions that are going to horrify you at some point in, in, as they're growing up, because they are actively making their faith their own. So they're going to have questions. Yeah. They're going to push back on stuff. And that is a really great thing unless you shut it down. Because if right. you shut it down, then Satan can can answer that in whatever way that he yes. can get in their mind and, and you know, kind of whisper, whisper yes. these little lies direct with media and that kind of thing. But if you are, you know, even if it means step away, be still, be quiet, you know, allow the Lord to work, but don't shut down those difficult questions. Those are great growth opportunities for your child, but also for you as a parent, because you're going to see God work through you in those times. Yeah, absolutely. And we are all sinners. Some of our sin just looks different from others, yeah. but our kids need to know that we are all sinners. And um, I mean, we've, we've walked through some pretty difficult circumstances this past year, year and a half where, you know, our kids came to us. We have one son who came to us, his girlfriend was pregnant and they are now married um, with a beautiful little boy, but that was a tough thing to walk through. But we did it and we wanted to, you know, we wanted to convey Christ's love. And um, that is, I really believe that is what we managed to do with that situation. It is not, you know, what we would have wanted, but we also weren't going to just come down on them. And, you know, they, they just happened to sin in a way that was very public. Right. And so many people, their sins are hidden. And you don't see them. And so they can, they can keep them away from the world. And this was one of those things that was very public. And, um, you know, we had to be careful how we handled it. 
But I believe very strongly that we needed to handle it with love and grace and mercy and forgiveness. And, you know, it is one of those situations that that sin is not going to define them. Your sin does not define you. There is a savior. This is not beyond hope. And, and that was the direction we pointed them in. And they are a very strong couple and, you know, they, they're getting ready to move. And their first thing they did was find a church. And I am, I'm very proud of how they are handling things, but God does not have grandchildren and they have to work things out for themselves. And I am just there as hopefully someone who is discipling and guiding as best I can, and also always, always pointing them to the cross. Oh, absolutely. And as a parent, it's so, um, it's so tempting because we don't want our kids to feel the full weight of their decisions, um, to, to intervene in that. And, and the fact that, as you noted before, you know, as you are parenting adults, as as, really any, any age group, your goal is restoration. Your goal is to point them to their savior, to help them understand his love, grace, and mercy through this, but also to see how he is able to take even our bad decisions that come with ramifications and work them together for good because he supersedes everything that we can even imagine. That is an object lesson that will never leave them. And that is so powerful and it grows their faith in ours as well. Um, but again, it takes being in a place as a parent where you are you are living in close enough relationship with the Lord that you're able to, to pour that out to your kids instead right. of just reacting out of... Um, fear for your own reputation or, you know, trying to hide or put stuff under a bushel because we just want to mitigate what people will say. Yeah. This cannot be about you. It is always about Christ. It cannot be about you. And yes, there are, there are going to be, you know, us, there's going to be people who say things there's going to be, um, difficult consequences, but it is always about Christ. And Christ is so good to use even our shortcomings, even our stumbles for our good and his glory, ultimately, if we submit our wills and our lives to him. Um, And that that is just a truth that should give every one of us such comfort and such hope uh, as we parent, but also as we live our lives. I mean, I'm I am making choices every day that don't please the Lord and that cause consequences. (laughs) Um, and, but knowing that he is still good and he forgives me and he draws me back into fellowship is a, an amazing thing. And it should lead me to always want to do likewise with my kids. Yes, absolutely. And that is what the family is. The family is a picture of God's relationship with us as believers. And so if we can keep that at the forefront of our minds, um, but so often we get in the way, you know, we're always like, well, what about me? And we do tend to be very selfish people. And, and a lot of times when you do have a child who stumbles or falls away, or there's some issue there, we tend to look at ourselves and think, oh, how's this going to reflect on me? And we really have to keep pointing them and keep pointing ourselves to Christ, keep preaching that gospel every single second to ourselves. And trust the Lord that his word doesn't return void. And that may be a very long runway of, of us wondering. And, you know, just honestly, we can't, we don't know how God is going to work, but we know that his word is powerful and it is alive. And so our responsibility as parents is to point our kids to Jesus, to give them every tool, every bit of information to have a solid foundation of their, of their own. And then we have to trust that the Lord will, will help that take root and not return right. void. Even if they pull against it and they, they go in another direction, it grieves us because we know that they're making things unnecessarily difficult on themselves, right. but we still have to trust the Lord. Yes, absolutely. It is not our job to be the Holy Spirit. 
it is our job to, again, you know, to be about restoration, um, to be about love, loving them Mm -hmm. um, and prayerfully loving them, hopefully back into the body of Christ. Um, But, you know, we it's really not our job to be the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, and that's important to remember for our spouse as well. Um, you know, I, I, it's hard. It's sometimes it's harder. Um, but yeah, the, the Bible doesn't say that I'm going to win him by my actions, but rather right. by my actions, by the way that I'm praying for him, by the way that I'm living in front of him. Yeah. So for those who are struggling because your spouse isn't supportive or isn't walking, um, the way that in a leadership role spiritually that you would like to see them just stay on your knees and be faithful and allow the Holy spirit to do his work. Don't try to intervene in that because we do so much damage both with our kids and our spouse when we try to play a role that isn't ours. Exactly. And quit looking around you at what you think your husband ought to be or your kids ought to be. God gave you a very unique family. He put them in the exact order. He put them in. He gave you the number that he gave you. He gave you the type of husband, the type of children that he did. And you've got to quit, you know, basing how your family is going to operate based on some other family. I think about that. I spent a lot of years wishing my husband would be a certain way. You know, he needs to lead family worship. He needs to do this. He needs to do that because that's what a godly husband does. Except I wasted a lot of time complaining and being that drippy wife and, you know, just drip, drip, drip all the time. Um, And I did not appreciate my husband's unique giftings that God gave him and the way that my husband leads our family. It is not the same as anybody else's family out there. And I can now look back on that and see, you know, my husband does things a certain way. You know, he's in the military and things are done a certain way. (laughs) And he does not look like any other woman's husband out there. And I should not want that because this is who God gave me. And he leads us in a different way than maybe, you know, all the homeschool books say, or even the homeschool speakers, you know, there's, there's a lot of sessions where you talk about, you know, family worship and such. And those are great. Unless as a wife, we come back from that nagging our husbands to be that. That is, again, Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit and your husband. You are not the Holy Spirit. So be appreciative of how your husband is leading the home Mm -hmm. and the family and your faith walk. Be appreciative of that. But realize that your family is not going to look like any other family out there. And God has a unique plan for you. And you need to respect that plan. Exactly. That's so, so true. And encourage him. You know, we, I think we seriously undervalue the impact that we as wives have when we just encourage and, and look for the things that they are doing well and right and build those things up. If, if, if you want to see him grow in his faith, then, then know when he is, you know, you, there are so many little things and it, it sparks a lot more gratitude in our heart mm-hmm. for what God is doing and the way that our husband is leading when we're looking for those things rather than trying to wedge our, you know, square peg in a round hole that doesn't fit our family. Yes, exactly. And even with our children, you know, the things that we say, there is a lot of power in women's words. And yeah. we really have to recognize that power. And, um, when we speak to our kids, when we speak to our husband and also not to have ulterior motives, you know, when we, when we say thank you for doing this, there shouldn't be a, yeah, but behind it, you know, it should be gracious. It should be genuine that we really do appreciate how our husband is doing things. And we really do appreciate how our kids are, you know, doing things in their homeschool and their faith walk and whatever it is, you know, be appreciative of those things and not always have a yeah, but behind it. Exactly. Exactly. And it really comes down to what your vision is. Um, You know, families don't, don't flounder for lack of resources or lack of, you know, of, of, checklists or whatever, they they flounder for lack of a vision of what God has actually called them to do. And so by really focusing in on what you are called to be as a mom, as a dad, as a family, um, and leaning into that, 
looking to the Lord to strengthen your faith and to grow you in a way to do that job really well, you're going to avoid a lot of these, a lot of these pitfalls of comparison and of trying to be someone else or something else or rely on rules or whatever. Um, Cause God has given us a very clear call of what he wants our families to be and, and how they are to look. And you find that in scripture. So just diving in there. Yes. And we all have different ways of fulfilling that call. We're all going to look different. You know, not everybody is going to run a huge homeschool conference. Not everybody is going to write a blog. Not everybody is going to be a preacher's wife. A lot of times we get hung up on the idea that the only way to serve God is through some sort of ministry that is specific to missions or specific to, you know, the pastorate or something like that. No, no, no. We fulfill God's calling in our lives just by being in our homes and being faithful. And so it can be anything that you are doing. Several years back, there was a big push for all men and all families in the homeschooling community to be entrepreneurs. All of them should have their own job. Nobody should work for the man. And here was my husband who worked for the man, you know, the, the government, the big man, he was with the big man. (laughs) And whoa, we were kind of countercultural there to the, to the homeschool community. And my husband was just like, that's not what I was called to. I wasn't called to be an entrepreneur. He said, I enjoy my job. This is what God called me to. And it was difficult to navigate that sometimes because it, there was such a push to you know do your own thing, but not everybody is called to that. And there again, we have to respect our unique families. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Amy, I, I hate to shut it down. I'm having such a good time talking with you, but we are out of time. Before we go, though, I want you to tell everybody where they can find you and and also give us a hint of what you're going to be talking about at Teach Them Diligently so that they can start making their plans to see you there. Absolutely. So you can find me at RaisingArrows.net. I have a YouTube channel as well and a podcast um, by the same name. And um, I will be speaking on homeschool management for the homeschool mom. So how to run a household while you homeschool, how to get those homemaking chores accomplished while you homeschool and large family homeschooling. So basically how to homeschool multiple ages and to do that effectively and efficiently and also Jubilee homeschooling. And this one is very near and dear to my heart. Um, It's basically the idea of taking a sabbatical year, a break, a changing how you homeschool and giving yourself refreshment for the year and how to do that, why you would do that and what Mm -hmm. that looks like for individual families. Oh, I love that. So we we may have to get another podcast just to talk about that Jubilee idea. I love that. Um, well, thank you again so much for joining us today. It it was a joy. I I trust that it was helpful to a lot of people just to to kind of hear the conversation organically happening back and forth. Um, I hope it gave hope and you know maybe just a different way of looking at things. So thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. You are very welcome to the rest of you. Thank you for spending your time with us today. You know, we talk all the time about how the Great Commission starts at home. Your home is your Jerusalem. Everything that you do within there is serving the kingdom, and it is so very important. You have a platform with your kids that nobody else in the world does. And so as you are growing and changing to be more like Christ, you are so naturally able to let that overflow in discipleship of your children, of shepherding their hearts, of giving them a foundation foundation for their faith that isn't built on superficial things, but rather is built on a relationship with the King of Kings, who is their savior and their forgiver and one full of grace and truth. So I hope that this has been an encouragement to you to really refocus Um, Maybe if you've lost your way a little bit or you've been questioning all this stuff that's going on, um, I hope that this points you back to the the solid foundation that is found only in Jesus. Um, He is the hope for your family. He is the hope for your marriage. He is the hope for your children. Um, So I I hope this has been a help. I invite you to join us at Teach Them Diligently in the spring. Come see Amy. I would love to talk to you. Um, Again, just get your tickets now. We'll be in Pigeon Forge and Branson, and we would absolutely love to see you there. So have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to talking to you again real soon.